how to safely detonate suspicious content. So this is what we're gonna talk about is methods that I've used in the past to kind of deal with content, be it fish, be it malicious attachments, be it questionable, just I don't know what this is. But I'm not sure I really feel safe about opening it on my system. So let's try to get this somewhere where it'll work. Okay, let's do that. So what we're gonna talk about is some of that. I'm gonna go over that here, but what I'm really hoping to do is blow your mind. <laughs> yeah. Thank you to our sponsors. Also, thank you to my work. I work at 10th Street. Uh, we're a software as a service company in the transportation industry. We connect commercial driver license holders with companies that are trying to find qualified drivers. Who am I? I'm Stephen Judd. Some of you have met me. I'm sorry. Some of you are meeting me for the first time. You're sorry. <laughs> I'm a multi-year, multi-discipline IT pro. Uh, my, my LinkedIn and my resume looks like buzzword bingo for the, the technology I've touched and worked with. I'm not actually an expert in pretty much anything except talking, telling dad jokes, and PowerShell. So, and I, I barely make the PowerShell line. I am a PowerShell enthusiast, if you can't tell. And all my other bling, yes, I design my own t-shirts, yes, whatever. Dad joke enthusiast, I warned you. I'm also a fashion icon, or at least, yeah, whatever. Maybe not. Okay, why does this talk matter to you? Thank you for coming, why do you care? Well, if you deal with potentially malicious content at all, then this matters, because you don't wanna be opening that on your home computer or your parents' computer, and you don't want your parents opening it, and you don't want your friends opening it, because it's a safe assumption for this audience that you're gonna be dealing with some malicious content. Also, if you don't have lots of budget, budgets go up, budgets go down, pandemic, trouble, whatever. So I'm gonna show you some really awesome ways to do with very little money. Or if you wanna use your budget for something else, okay, use it for something else, I don't care. And also if you just want some ideas. Maybe none of this applies to you, but you look at it and you go, you know what, I can use that. So let's do that. The environment I'm gonna be working from is basically my laptop. I'm gonna be using Windows Client. Yes, it is Windows 11. I like it. And we're gonna be using Docker Desktop because I'm gonna be doing container work because a container is a good way to, to make sure that bad things don't necessarily reach out onto your current host. Okay, methods demonstrated. I'm, this is all the boring stuff. We're gonna have browser in a container. We're gonna have an OS in a container, and finally, we're gonna end up with a VM image, okay? That's what we're gonna be talking about. But before we get to do everything, this is what you actually came for, which is the dad joke transition, number one. What do colorblind people do to secure classified documents? They gray dact them. Because, okay, I'm not gonna explain it to you. Yes, you can have every dollar back if you leave right now. Uh, the question from the audience was, do we get our money back if we leave now? <laughs> Thanks, Paula. Browser in a container. So it's a Firefox image. People like Firefox, security people like Firefox because it has built-in sandboxing. Yeah, okay. So here it is. The great thing about this particular image is you can go there to the GitHub and you can see all the code, all the code. So if you don't like the base image, change it. If you don't like something in there, change it. If you say, I just wanna see if it's good. All right, go read it. Perfect. Docker Hub. So they take that image, they push it up to Docker Hub. That's how I get it. Demo time. Oh, let's see if I can make this work. I'm gonna go here. What all do I have open here? Safely detonate. Okay, so we've got Actually, I wanted to do this from here. Don't type in demos, <laughs> rule number one, right? Okay, so I'm gonna run demo number one. It's just, I like to put weight debugger in my demos. You can risk it by making sure you have F9 in the right place, but having weight debugger, it'll do the same thing. So when I press F5, you like the screencast mode there? Pretty cool, you can see when I push buttons, so I like it. So I'm gonna F10 out of that, and I'm gonna say Docker pull, the image. Now, I already have it, so I cheated a little bit. 
So, so it's just going to say, hey, your image is already up to date. But if there was a newer one, I would get the newer one. So any updates, it just rolls. If you want to pin versions, this is how containers work. I'm not going to try to explain containers to you because, frankly, I'm not an expert. Go talk to Anthony Nocentino. Uh, Docker run. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to run this container with the dash D, which is detached mode. So it's going to run in the background. I'm saying call it Firefox on the ports 5800 and 5800, and then this V, it's basically mapping a location on my system where it can do, um, what sort I'm looking for? Uh, content that isn't gonna dissipate when the container, persistent storage, thank you very much, perfect. All right, let's run it. All right, well I can't run the last one because when you run an IP address in code, it goes, no, I don't know what you're talking about. So I'm gonna control click this sucker and launch. Fun part, when I do this, it launches in the background. Oops, that's the wrong window. There it is. Now that loaded fast. This thing is light. We're talking about megs, okay? But the great thing about it is you can just go in here and say, risky, what am I gonna type in here? Yahoo? Uh, let's do something actually a little more on target. Yeah, nice roses, appreciate it. Okay, so that loaded in the Firefox image over the other, but it's not, it's not on my host OS. Now, hey, I wanna copy something from one to the other. Sorry, so I'm gonna go get a URL here uh, from, I don't know, actually let's don't pull a URL. Let me just pull any text. We'll do safely.net. Because what happens if you need to log on to something in order for this to work? You know, like your email, because you need your password. Well, how do you get your password from one to the other? This thing has a little bin over here where you can do the clipboard. So I can paste in here, and then when that's over here, I can then paste there. That's how you move things back and forth from one to the other. The guy who built it, built that in. Does anyone see a problem with that? Clear text passwords by any chance that you just copied from your password manager and go from one to the other? Yeah, that could be a problem. Yeah, the other problem with the persistent storage, you're, you're, you're shaking your head, but you know better. <laughs> uh, the other problem with the persistent storage is it may cache something that you may not want cached. Okay, so if I was gonna use this thing in a corporate environment, which I wouldn't do, by the way, but if I was, I'd get rid of the persistent storage. So every time I loaded this thing, it was completely pristine, remembers nothing. That's how it remembers things like where I've been, right? Hey, look, I went to Facebook, or no, I didn't go to Facebook. I need to type in something here. Yeah, so here's some stuff I have gone to, just for messing around, okay? Let's not read too much into my choices. All right, let's get out of this, because we're done here. Oh, that was the point I wanted to make in here though, is like I've got these, these things in here. Let me go to junk, junk mail. So like if I have something over here that's in junk mail, was it junk? Yeah. Am I? Oh, I did, I missed. I misclicked. Thank you, thank you. All right, so here's some stuff. It's all Azure, because I don't actually get junk in this particular account and I click keep it clean. Uh, no, thank you. The question was, do I want some? And the answer is no. All right, but the point is, is you can open it up in here, especially if it's a phishing link, right? So you can open up a phishing link in this browser and it won't put your computer at risk, okay? Let's get back over to the slides. <coughs> All right, so that's a difference. So I call this browser's castle defense. So I'm kind of like taking a bunch of memes, a bunch of the things, but oh, whatever. You guys knew what you were getting into when you walked in here. Strengths. The strengths of this is it's easy, it's light, it's fast. Right? I love that. And there's no risk to the host OS. So I gave this presentation at a security conference in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and had a guy come to me afterwards, and he was right. He said, actually, <laughs> There is some risk to the host OS because there are exploits that try to step out of a container if they notice they're in a container. So this slide isn't 
exactly pristinely right, but think about the attack vector that would have to be exploited to jump out of a Firefox container running on a Windows system and then step over and then execute. Not impossible, but doable, yes. Hard and unlikely. Free. Everybody loves free. This is free as in free as in free. Weaknesses, well I covered a couple of them, but container skills are required. You gotta know what you're doing somewhat in containers. That's just the way it is. And this is only for browser solutions. It's like if you need to open an EXE, you need to test something else, it's not gonna work in this. And then I showed you it's hard to move links back and forth. That's, a, that's just a challenge that, that is this way. Last one is the key for me, at least, is the host IP is trackable. Because you're running this on your computer in your container, then the remote system, if it has any beaconing in the code, it's gonna know it came from you. Now, is that a problem? Requisite drink of water to show the seriousness? Eh, but maybe you don't wanna expose your IP space to the bad guys. It's just the way it is. All right, dad joke transition number two, because you know we're gonna go talk about something else. So I gotta give you dad joke transition number two. I asked a coworker if they know what Tor is. Because you know, I used to work in digital security. It's like, hey, do you know what Tor is? They said, yeah, it's the onion router. I said, no, it's the god of thunder. <laughs> Complete with animation. I mean, you were getting your money's worth. I followed by a tumbleweed. I needed that. All right, OS in a container. Windows services for <laughs> Linux. Um, I'm glad that's not gonna show up on the recording. Windows services for Linux, version two using Kali. How many are familiar with Kali Linux? All right, it's a good one. Used by digital security people, lots of forensic tools already baked in, that's awesome. Here is how to install Kali Linux on Windows 11. By the way, all my slides will be posted so you don't have to try to figure out the URLs. Also, in Edge, when you copy the URL and paste it, it gives you the title of the, the page and not the actual URL. Unless you go to uh, PowerShell, I just uh, unless you go to PowerShell and you do GCP pipe SCP, which is set clip, get clipboard, set clipboard, and then it takes all that out. Pro tip. So that's not exactly what I did, by the way. I'm gonna show you what I did, because you'll see, demo. Where is my demo two? Demo two. By the way, I'm feeling kind of nervous. Am I talking really fast, or just, for me, no? <laughs> Fair enough. All right, up here at the top. I got the link for where I got the instructions from, so you know, copied it in here. First thing I do is I check for admin because there's gonna be commandlets in here that will not work unless you're an admin and running as an admin. One of them that I think is kind of fun is this enable win Windows optional feature. Well, if you're gonna enable features on a computer, it makes sense to that, that, that requires admin. You know what else requires admin? Get Windows optional feature. feature. I can't explain that, I didn't write it. Anyway, so I'm saying, all right, well for this to work, you need the Windows subsystem for Linux and you need the virtual machine platform and then you enable those and I put some write host in here and I say, hey, if you have restart needed, you need to restart and this thing's gonna kick you out because it restarts the computer. Also, I'm kind and I say, read host, press enter to reboot or control C to cancel. That's kind of an easy way for people to go, Enter or control C. I like it. All right, so then I'm gonna do some commands, but my commands are WSL commands. And the WSL commands by default return UTF-16. PowerShell can display UTF-16, no problem. It looks like text. It is not technically text that you can work with. So what I had to do is I had to do this output encoding in order to get this to work. I got this code from uh, Jordan Borean. Uh, apologies if mis mispronounced last name. Uh, he hooked me up with this and there is a 
GitHub request to add this to PowerShell 7 future version. So it's kind of nice. But what I'm doing here is I'm saying, put, take my WSL version and my WSL list content, and then I'm gonna go in and check and see, all right, are you running version one? Okay, are you doing version two? So I can set all the things. By the way, all of these steps are in the instructions. I just automated it because we automate things in order to make our lives better. That's what we do, we're PowerShell people. All right, and then finally I install Linux here. Check to see if it's already installed, so I check, I has Kali Linux there, otherwise install it, okay? WSL, I copy a script. Now here's an interesting command. What I'm doing is I'm saying set up Kali. By default, when you install Kali, I'm gonna pull this up right quick here. Whoop, I don't wanna do that. Cause that's gonna, I'm gonna scroll too far. I wanna just, I'm gonna start a new one. How visible is that? Okay, there we go. This is a minimal installation of Kali Linux. You likely wanna install supplementary tools. By default, when you get the Kali Lin Linux image from Microsoft, it just gives you the basics. What I'm doing here in this setup Kali script is I'm saying update, then do a full upgrade. So I get all the tools and then I say, yeah, update the meta package or install the meta package. And the meta package takes all the tools because sometimes you want all the tools. If you don't want this, that's fine, okay? But that's why right here I'm saying copy this file. Now I'm copying, because it's a WSL command, it's actually running this inside of the Linux container, right? So then it pulls over the, the setup Kali dot sh file and I'm putting it in my home directory. And then I tell myself, hey, you know, this is a fun little gig here. I'm just gonna do this. Uh, da, 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 I'm, gonna run, I'm gonna run this stuff, because it's fun. It has little arrows, it tells you what to do, and it has different colors. It's, pardon me if I'm a little, I'm a little like impressed by myself. I'm easily impressed by myself. All right, so then we run Kali Linux, because I just told myself you have to run that setup script. Now you have to run that from inside Kali Linux, because I couldn't figure out how to launch Kali Linux, run the script, and have it work. There's probably a way to do it. I just couldn't figure it out. Next step, you need to set up Kali. All right, so what does setup Kali mean? This is doing a full upgrade and then installing this thing called, I'm on the wrong one, setup win kex. This is the next one. So I check to see in bash if you're running as root, because this has to be run as root in order for it to work. Then you update again, because you always have to update Linux every time you breathe on it, you have to update it. And then apt install Kali win kex. Well, why do we care about Kali win kex? Glad you asked, even though you didn't ask, I'm gonna show you. And then I tell myself, hey, you need to run this. Since I've already done all this, and since this is a one gigabyte download, I'm not gonna rerun it, because I want my demos to work. I thought about recording it and then playing it back at 10x speed, you know, and put some, put some do -do 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 -do, or you know, some, something like that. I think it'd be fun, but I'm weird like that. All right, let's run this thing. So I'm now running the WinCAC server inside of my Kali instance. And if all things go right here, boom. I now have a full UI Kali Linux install opened up. I have Firefox and I have all the tools. Question. Right, I'll go back. Did I say what WinCAX is? No, I didn't explain it. It's basically, no, not necessarily, not necessarily. Uh, not everyone in the room knows what it is except you. I used to use uh, XRDP. Everyone knows what RDP is. If you've ever done anything connecting to Windows ever since 2000 terminal server and on, you know, you've used RDP. I used XRDP. New uh, guidance from the install for Kali within the last year or two or so, they said use WinCAX because what WinCAX allows you to do is open this up in a special session uh, 
I don't know the protocols that it's using, but you can window it. Now, right now, I'm running full screen because I wanted the full screen experience, but you can run them in a window, and that's what's cool about it. And you can run just single apps if you know what you're doing in WinCAX. So it's much better than, than other connections, but this is just what it's for. Like Citrix? Published apps, yeah, published apps like Citrix, similar to that. Okay, so now that you've got this, you can definitely go to, you know, like Kali.org, or you can now load your malicious URL and paste it in here. Now, what are the chances that someone can do a payload sent to your generally more Windows-centric users that you then copy and put into Linux, and it goes, oh, I see you're in a Linux container running on WSL2, I'm gonna now escape out of that and put something on your host OS. Chances are really bad for that one. So is this perfectly safe? No, I still don't think this is perfectly safe, but this is solid. All right, let's go back to the slides. Fun part here, when I do Alt-Tab, I'm Alt-Tabbing on, the image here, so I actually have to get out because it's captured it because I'm running full screen. Okay, more code before I get away from this because I wanted to show you this. This, I'm gonna close this because we don't care about that. This is how to reset Kali. Very quick, very easy. All right, so this time I wrote a function to do the command text because I got tired of having write host, write host, write host, write host lines. So now I have a function, because this is how I automate things, to say what's my pre-command, what's my command, and what's my post-command, and then it does the colors for me, and it puts the arrows around it. And so now I can just call this inside my script instead of having that other stuff, because that's how I do it. And I splat, so I splatted this one. I said here's my pre-command, here's my command, here's my post-command, and then I do this. You wanna see it? Why not? <coughs> Let's see if this will work. F8. <laughs> I'm winging it. This isn't part of my presentation. All right, to there. Ta-da. Yeah, isn't it great? Okay. It's not that great. But what you do is in here, you unregister Kali, and then you install Kali, and you reset. Now, when you do that, you have to run your scripts again, because you just reset it. So if you want the minimal, you don't have to do that, but if you want win caps, you still have to do that one. And so that's what the rest of this is. Hey, run this script, run that script. And then it reminds you to do that. That's how you reset. I got a better way to do it. Export the image. Now this is very much more corporate, because once you build your Linux image that gets the way you want it, and it has all the tools precisely the way you want it, and you have got it sanctioned through your digital security department, and they said, yes, this is exactly what we want, then you can just export. Now you have an image. Now, the image, impossible to see, I know, I'm sorry, so I zoom. It ain't small, so it's five and a half, a little over five and a half gig, right? So if you're swinging an image around, you just gotta know that it's, it's this size and that's the way it is. But you can copy it, now it's pristine, and then you can restore it. Let me zoom back out. And then I think I even have a, re did I have restore? Yep, import. Here are the commands. Okay, I can't, oh, beat it, you. And don't need you. There we go. You just import the image. Question. Do I know offhand or on hand if authentic code signatures are supported? No, I don't know. I don't know. Probably, but I don't know. Any other questions since we paused? Nope. Okay, good. All right, let's see. So next up is demo three. But before we get there, we need to talk about Old McDonald's images. kali -I -O. Right? Strings. Full OS to examine content. That's what's great about it. You have a full Kali image. You can do anything that Kali can do in that container. And it's powerful. I love it. It's easy to reset. Two lines, boom. And then you run the scripts that I'm going to give you, and boom, you're set up. What could be easier than that? It's great, I love it. And 
is free, just like the other one is. If you got Windows, uh, do the Docker. Now the Docker part isn't necessarily free. Now this is me operating as myself in my capacity, so it's a single person organization, so I'm licensed by Docker. You may not be. You may have to have another container solution. I'm just telling you that now, so the licensed lawyers don't come after me. So it's not technically free, free, but eh, good enough, right? Weaknesses, some assembly is required, especially if you want it to do exactly what you want it to do. And you'll have to repeat that unless you automate the reset, okay? Or no, you'll have to repeat it unless you automate it after a reset. That's what I meant to say. So some assembly required. Yes, that's from Ikea. And your host IP is still trackable because it's running in a container on your system. Now, how do you avoid that? Go to Starbucks and do your forensics there, right? That's what all the hacker people do, right? Okay, dad joke transition number three. Now this one's an audience participation joke. Are they all audience participation jokes? All right, well this one is specifically designed for audience participation. All right, me, this, this, this is the part I read. I screwed up and used the wrong protocol for secure communications, and now my network has gone quiet. Now, of course, this is Mike, so I have to repeat it, so it just kind of ruins the joke here, but what protocol did you use? <laughs> SHH? I don't get it. Shh. Okay. <laughs> Can I explain it is the, the question from the audience. No. <laughs> VM image, let's talk about this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do an Azure VM. Now, when I do the Azure VM, I have to connect to Azure. In order to connect to Azure, it takes a little bit of time. So I'm gonna start that now so that my demo is pretty much ready when it it's time to demo. So first I got to request a terminal. Now you see what I'm doing, I'm using Cloud Shell. Okay, that's how I'm doing this. I do this all in Cloud Shell. I'm using Azure. This will work in other clouds. I'm now stealing content from my slides, but I have to start this. SJC, so I'm gonna create my detonation PC. Okay, that's gonna start. I'm gonna go back to here. It's a scripted setup. It is a scripted removal because I believe in automation. Use the cloud hosting provider of your choice. I don't care if you use AWS. I don't care if you use GCP. I kind of care if you use Oracle or IBM, but that's just a professional matter. They're good. They're just not the others. Demo. That wasn't enough time to get that started. And I know that because I've run through this before. So like right now, it's creating my VM, please wait. This creation takes five minutes. I have not been able to get this shorter. There are ways to get it shorter. Like you can create your own image and just replicate it and start up your VM. Yes, you can do that because you have budget. I'm broke, right? Or actually, I'm not broke. I just don't wanna spend my money on this image and I don't, I don't care about the five minutes. I don't care, right? It's five minutes. Anyway, while it's doing that, I'm gonna to try to entertain you by showing you code. Isn't that better than telling dad jokes? Don't answer that question, you'll hurt my feelings. So here's what it's doing when it does the creation. I say, okay. What, you see an error? All right. Error actions, yeah. Yeah, well, I said it globally for reasons. Okay, so let's just take a look at this right quick. So, and I just realized, I just realized I started that VM with the wrong password and I hope I can remember the password. <laughs> Cause I was supposed to start it with another password. Oh, well, I'll figure it out. So the first thing I do is I check to see whether you're running Linux or you're running Windows cause I wanna get the user. How many people all knew that the environment was different between the different OSs? How many of you have ever put this code in your, your, your code in order for you to figure out what the username is? Super useful. Please steal this. 
I stole it from someone else. All right, then I stick that username on the end of Win10VM, and then I put some resource, resource group tags on here. So I've got the boss and the big boss, and I'm in digital security, and this is a digital security detonate OS. And now here's the fun part. Pick the size that you want to spend money on. You want a server that's just going to haul butt and take names and all that business? Sure, put it in there. Do an F16, I don't care, right? It's your money. And then you pick the image. Now, I'm taking the Windows desktop, Windows 10. Someone asked me the last time I gave this presentation, why not Windows 11? I said, because I haven't done this. I wrote this back when there wasn't a Windows 11. So I've been using this for a while. Okay, here's the SKU and the latest, whatever. And the rest of this is building the image that it needs in order to create that VM. Okay, I create resource groups. Now what I've done in this, because it's Azure, I created a resource group to contain the entire VM. That way, when you get over here, I'm gonna jump ahead, to do remove, all I do is, this is supposed to highlight when I click that, because I missed, remove AZ resource group, and the entire image, go. Easy, love that. Okay, back to here, I'm vamping a little bit now. Um, where are we at? Uh, yeah, so I do some security rules. I like security rules. I'm gonna allow TCP inbound from the internet to an RDP port, 3389. You probably don't wanna do 3389, but I'm lazy and I like it, okay? And I'm doing this, I'm standing up a box and then I'm destroying it. Now the fun part in Azure, as soon as you stand up a box that's listening on 3389, you can go look at the event log, you can just see the people trying. Let's go back to this, 3389. Don't use 3389 for stuff, but who cares on this box? You know the username, I created it. You know the password, I created it. I made it hard. I didn't do pass at word with an O that so many people like to do from Microsoft demos, right? I entered something that I hope I can remember when I get to that part of this, like the login. I have it in clear text. <sighs> and then I'll have to change it everywhere. All right, so I set up the network, I set up the public IP address, I go to the interface parameters. Here's a fun thing that I do in here. Uh, operating system, this is all just boilerplate stuff that you can get from anywhere. And then remember the creating VM text? There it is, creates the resource group, passes all of that junk that I created as from all of those preparation objects in here. Now the fun thing is you can do almost the entire thing with one AZ CLI command, but that AZ CLI command is so long it got lost coming back to the cursor. Then I create an auto shutdown object. Why, I, why do I create an auto shutdown object? Because I don't wanna pay for this thing if I forget about it. So it's seven o'clock tonight, if I forget to shut this box down, it's gonna turn itself off. I really thought about changing this time to do a get date and make it two hours from right now. Wouldn't that be cool? I thought of that improvement before I got to this demo. I was like, you know, that'd be cool. Yeah, I could do it now, but I don't know, right? Okay, besides which, this code is the code I'm gonna put up on my GitHub. It's not the code I'm actually running in Azure Cloud Shell because this code doesn't have my password hard-coded into it. Then I do some edge first run experience. First run experience, okay, why do we do that? Because I get tired of hitting next, 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 next. Fun fact, if you're not part of the domain and you can't do the GPOs, most of the first run experience stuff doesn't actually work. So you still have to click a bunch of junk. Okay, fine, I did it anyway. And then it's connect to it via remote desktop. This is kind of fun, I thought. If you're in Linux, it says, okay, run it, run MSTSC, if you're in Mac, run, MSTSE. If you're in Windows, had I run this from my local machine by pulling down all the AZ commandlets, then it would prompt me, hey, I'm gonna go ahead and open MSTSE with your address and prompt you for the username and password. That's kinda cool. Okay, then it's done. And then here's the, here's the code I was using to run this thing. Yeah, I definitely should've used this code. All right, the reason I did this is because I call my um, SJ Win 10 VM function, which is everything from 292 up, and I say read host for the email to notify and read host for the prompt for the admin. So when you run this, try it on your own. It'll work. 
It'll ask you for your email address to notify you, hey, you're gonna shut down this box or I'm gonna shut down this box at seven o'clock. And then uh, it'll ask you for the password. All right, did I talk long enough for this thing now? Yup. All right, I'm gonna make that bigger too. All right, so since I ran it on Azure, and Azure is Linux, Azure Cloud Shell that is, I need to grab this IP address and step over here and say, connect sj.net PC. Why did I do that? Because it does all the junk for me. Except that was the wrong password. Man, I hope that's the right password. Oh, if you thought I was talking faster before. Okay, while this is coming up, you kind of get the gist of what's happening. This is gonna be a Windows 10 box. It's gonna have whatever applications you choose to install on it. You can actually, in the build of the, the client, have it run Winget or Chocolatey commands. I would run Winget to install Chocolatey and then do everything from Chocolatey, right? That's how I would do it. You do it how it works for you. And then once you're over here, you're like, okay, here's my box. That's it. I, I use this, this particular solution, I use it every week. I use this all the time. Let me get back to the slides because I am gonna have to finish up here. Your VM image is cloudy with a chance of malware. Now, once you do whatever on this thing, this system is effectively at risk. So what are the strengths? This is the most compatible. You're talking about a Windows OS. What do people attack? Windows, why? Because it's the market leader for people who don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Did I say that right? No, it's the market leader for client computers and businesses and people with money, yeah. Now you can write attacks on Mac and anybody who runs a Mac and says, I don't need any protection, they're kidding themselves. They're a target, just not a big one. It's easy to reset and the host IP is not trackable. Whose IP has that VM? That's Azure. Azure's got that IP. I put a public IP that's in the Azure space. Azure has a bunch of IPs. Good luck tracking that back to your organization or to you. Near impossible, I couldn't figure out a way to do it because Azure owns it and there's no tie between that thing and then I destroy it and it's, the connection is lost, okay? What are the weaknesses? Everything has weaknesses. There's some cost. This is not free. You're burning resources in Azure. Well, burning's not quite, you're using them. It's effective and it requires a cloud account. I'm using mine, which is fine. It's tied to my credit card and I have not spent more than $35 ever in a month. And that's when I forgot to turn the box off because I built it after seven o'clock and it ran until the next seven o'clock, right? That's why I should do the two hour. Save me some money if I mess up. Potential red tape. Now there's no help for you here because in your organization, your departments, your business may say, no, you can't do this. Or I wanna see how you're doing this. You need to explain this. You need to get a sign off from the EVP of I don't care. That's just gonna happen. All right, con let's conclude and get to the questions, if we have any. So we've seen three options. Each option has strengths and weaknesses. My preference is the VM image for the things that I talked about. I love it, it works great. I've used it for quite a while. These are in addition, in addition to the tools you may already have. Now, did I rain on anyone's other tools? No, use those too, but this is great. And if you wanna have it for your personal use, this is extra great. Two of them are full free, one is nominal cost. I recommend it. And remember to automate whatever solution you build for consistency. Now, because I'm gonna put this all up on the code, hub, get, get code hub, <sighs> GitHub, you get it for free. Now remember, this is just the lighting of the fuse. So you can do a lot more with it. All right, please stay in touch. This is my contact information. I will not respond to you on ICQ. That's a bragger thing there for how low my number is. That, that's it. But the last one is a new link, Shortcut Your Life. Okay, Shortcut Your Dot Life. If you go there, um, I'm gonna be setting up some new stuff up there. 
Right now it just goes to my blog, but I'm hoping to get a merch site for some of my swag if you wanna buy it. Not cheap advertisement, but seriously, I wanna do that just so I can, I can afford to hand out more stuff at conferences for people that are enthusiastic like me about PowerShell and automation. Okay, and then thank you very much this is the, you know, fill this out, obligatory. You heard me talk about it at lunch. Uh, please fill these out. And the notorious PIG and I, thank you for coming to my session. Oh, questions, yes, sorry. I've, I, I just went, I just tuned off my brain. Have I looked at Windows Sandbox? Not in a while, because this solved my need, okay? And the trick with the Windows Sandbox, as I understand it, is still running on your local host. It is. And so there's still potential host risk and the IP address tracking. So especially if you're doing, like it really is about, are you gonna open an email that has beaconing content and you wanna snoop it? Well, as soon as you open it, you got some level of risk. So Windows Sandbox can let you turn off the yeah, so Windows Sandbox can let you turn off the network. Okay, he's saying that there's one XML file for your entire config and you trash it and it's gone. It's a brilliant solution. I haven't done it. I did this. Any other questions? Comments? Usually someone says bad jokes after that, but you've already got your fill, I'm sure. Okay, thank you. <laughs>